Hey everybody, final thoughts time for Museum Pictura. And wow, I went into this game with the completely wrong set of assumptions. And as a result, this surprised the heck out of me. And let me tell you what I mean by that. This is actually the sequel to a game I covered many, many years ago. Geez, I feel like maybe like four or five years ago called Museum. Which was um, also set in the uh, Roaring Twenties. It was also about players running museums. In that game, you were um, doing more uh, uh, archaeological-based rather than painting-based museums. And it was also a game all about card drafting from cards around the world and putting them on display and trying to get collections and score points. So on the surface, I mean, and it even featured this really cool idea of hey, when you discard cards to pay for other cards, they go into storage, and then other players can actually use them. So, the original museum, I would say probably the, the base of the game has so much in common. There may be like 65-70% the same game, Museum and Museum Pictura. And what I assumed was Museum Pictura, which is so... Because the thing is, Museum looks like a really, really lightweight, family-friendly gateway game, but it had a real surprising amount of depth. It could be incredibly crunchy as you are trying to figure out, with every single card you try to draft, just, okay, what am I trying... Do I care more about the location this is from? Do I care more about the... Um, uh, I forget. Here they're called, you know, the uh, era it's from and the, uh, the, the, the type of art. Uh, there were two different things. But every card in Museum and Museum Pictura has two different ways it could go towards building a big collection that you can score a lot of points on by putting it on display in your museum. And every, in both of these games, it is so hugely important to think hard about what are you trying to grab right now? What are you trying to grab for end game goals? What are you trying to grab to keep away from your opponent? When is it worth sacrificing to go into their basement so that you can get stuff that they jettisoned because it's perfect for you and they never knew. So both games share that same core DNA. And I thought Museum Pictura was going to be the lightweight. It was going to be the simple streamlined version of the game. It is not. As far as I'm concerned, Museum Pictura ratchets up the depth, not the complexity. This game might actually be simpler in terms of rules overhead, but in terms of actual depth of decision-making, of crunchiness, of all the different plates you're keeping spinning, of all the different considerations and compromise you have to make through, this game is significantly heavier than Museum that came before. Now, I should say, for both games, I'm talking about just the core game. Both games have actually gotten a fair bit of expansion content. I don't know about that stuff. I'm just comparing the base game to the base game. This game, um, there's a lot of things that have changed. Some of them very small, seemingly inconsequential. Some of them ginormous. Um, the biggest huge change is uh, the way you draft cards. In the original Museum, it was, uh, oh, look, I just grab all the, I grab a card out of there, I take it, at the end of the round, it'll refill. Very simple. In this game, at the start of turn, I've got cards in hand, and I must engage in trade with four existing museums that are basically, you know, just existing out there in the world. I know what every one of those museums values, and I can see everything they've got on display. And every round, I, on my turn, I must give up one of my cards and take one. That is a very different proposition than just, oh, look for what's best and just take it. Uh, in this game, every turn, you actually draw two cards. You are drowning in opportunities. You're getting new stuff all the time. But after you draw those two cards, you look at them and you say, well, okay, which of these am I going to give up to take one of these out there? And, you know, there's a lot. Just this one change is... It just so increases the complexity because, of course, every one of these museums has um, you know their own particular trend card that determines what they value. And if I and the thing is, this is a huge source of points. If I can take something that a given museum doesn't really care about, thereby not losing any points, and give them something that they hugely value, then I can make more points. And on the flip side, if they've got the card that I need so badly, so very badly, and maybe it makes me lose two or three points, and then what have I got? I don't have anything they want. I just have to give them something. I could, I could net lose points, and that's brilliant. It's such a simple idea. 
but it, I mean, and, and it's thematically based. Oh, they really value this. If, if I basically have a hostile trade where I take something they really care about, I'm going to lose points. If I give them something they really care about, I'm going to, I'm going to gain points because this is all about the prestige, not just about my museum with the rest of the world, but with, uh, you know, prestige amongst my fellow museums. They don't like hostile, aggressive trades where I take the things they value. They like me to give them something they value and take stuff off their hands and I can be a net transfer of points. And while that's not going to be the biggest source of points at the end of the game, it's one of the biggest source of points throughout the game. Because you want to be scoring, hopscotching up this uh, track as fast as you can because every time you score another 10 points, you get another um, favor card, and these are incredibly powerful. Although the game is a race. First player to 50 points gets 5 bonus points and triggers the end of the game. So, anyway, you can get points by hook or by crook. And a big way to score them is by engaging in smart trade with these other museums. And the other interesting thing is, that doesn't only happen on your turn. It happens on every player's turn. On every player's turn, first they engage in trade, they must, and then every other player around the table can do it if they want. And so, um, in a two-player game, you know, there's really just kind of two cards, um, you know, uh, popping in and out because you know all these museums always keep four on on hand at all times. I would love to try this at a higher player count because that would be making the layout of these museums change really dynamically over the course of the game. Um, but anyway, it's a really, really cool idea. Very, very, very different. Um, you know, it's interesting for me in Gen 2, we mostly play two-player games, so we rarely get to play games that have a lot of trade where, oh, what am I going to give up? What do I want in trade? Here, it's just woven into the DNA. Every round, you're engaged in multiple trades with a third party, and it's brilliant. And it is so much deeper than a traditional, oh, well, I'll just look at all the cards and I'll end up taking that one. Nope, you draw two. You're always getting two new things, and then you're like, okay, well, surgically, what will I get rid of to get something new? Bearing in mind the existing traits that these museums have. But then that's just the start of your turn, because then you've got to gauge in really just painful sometimes, but in a good way, tough, tough decisions about, all right, I'm going to put some of these on display in my museum. Which ones am I going to display? Hey, all three of these. This is great. Three Baroque cards. That's going to get me a big enough collection that I could put it on display next turn. But that means I have to sacrifice all of these cards. And none of these cards are trendy right now. I should really be putting this on display because right now the world wants to see more mythology. I'll get two bonus points if I put that on play. But that's not going to help me at the end of the game. I don't have any other mythology cards. Am I just going to take two points right now? Or am I going to jettison the bird in the hand for the three in the bush I can get later? But the important thing is, um, you know, if I play these three and I discard these other three, that's no big deal, because on a future turn, I could say, hey, you know what? It's time for some inventory. I'm just going to grab all my cards back, and then suddenly, boom, I got a huge hand of cards. And I could start building it all over again. This is such a wonderful um, hand management system overall, because it feels very, very different than you know other games of its ilk, like say, Concordia, that have this kind of flow that, oh, I've got a bunch of cards, sooner or later I'm going to have played them all, and then I've got to get them all back. Because one thing is, as I play them, they become open markets for other players to take. Although, don't feel bad for me. If somebody ends up taking some of my cards, I will end up netting points. That person loses points, I gain points. It might be worthwhile. I might actually put stuff out there hoping you'll take it from me because I'd rather have the points because I'm never going to use that card. So, there are so many interesting things going on in this game. Between the um, you know the the worldwide trend every round giving you new short term objectives to try to chase after my trends for building towards the end of the game the trends that I care about of all the different um, international museums that I'm engaging in trade with and then often having these gigantic hands of cards where I can only play so many of them and I am trying to do super duper heavy duty set collection because each one of these cards can contribute to two sets at once. A given card can contribute to its type and also to its era. But that becomes the other thing. Say by the end of the game, you know, somebody hit 50 points and I had actually gotten all these cards on display and hopefully I'd made some points somewhere along the way. Now, in what could only be considered a very fiendish jigsaw puzzle, I have to decide, right, how am I going to do my final layout of this 
museum because I am I, I can't just have the sets. I have to be able to create contiguous groupings of the sets. And if I'm smart, I can actually have one card, you know, be at the epicenter to score, hey, this card is applying towards my Rococo set and also towards my religious set at the same time. And so, the, I mean, the fact that the game ends almost... It's weird. It kind of feels like a boss fight because we, got, we went through all this set collection, all this grabbing of resources, and now we have the big, huge, epic fi finale where we got to figure out how to get all this stuff laid out to maximize our points. It's a very, very satisfying ending as we tally up and see, oh my god, how many blue cards did you get? Jeez Louise, how did you pull that off? Um, but what did you sacrifice to be able to get that one huge set? Um, probably you don't have a lot of other stuff, but hey... There, you might have sacrificed, just had one huge set, and hit a lot of patrons along the way. Or earned more favors that could give you bonuses. Or had put on more interim, um, what do you call them? Uh, uh, exhibitions, which give you a little bit of points along the way, but more importantly unlock incredibly powerful bonuses that will help you for the rest of the game. Or will help you in in-game scoring. So that could be a focus as well. Every one of these cards you play Every one of these cards you discard, you have to be thinking about five, four or five different potential uses for that card. There's what I'm using it for right now, but what am I going to use it for in three rounds? And that's why I'm saying some of this made its way into the original museum. And I thought that game was brilliant too. You can go back and watch my original run through. Just do a search for Rado Museum. You'll find it. My final thoughts. But this game takes museum and just so ratchets it to the next level. This is one of the heaviest games I have played this year because, not because of the rules complexity. Again, the rules are fairly simple, even simpler than the original museum. But the depth that is on display here really takes it to another level because, um, you know, I said these are multi-use cards, but multi-use in a way I don't normally see. They're strategically multi-use as opposed to just mechanically multi-use. And that makes this game very special indeed. My my only complaint about it is, and this is something I talked about with my wife, Jen, after we'd played it some, we both kind of feel like, man, is this too much? Is this getting to the point? Because you can get into some real analysis paralysis, some AP-type moments here. You're like, okay, well, I know I need to keep this card for next round. Um, but, uh, so what else am I going to sacrifice now? Or maybe do I drop all that? Do I, do I pivot and pursue this other thing? This game is rich and crunchy. And don't get me wrong, I should have mentioned right up front, Stunning, beautiful, simple, elegant, easy to play. The epitome of, a, of an elegant game with incredibly rich depth. This is the kind of thing you normally only see in like a Go style game. But here, it's been put into set collection. And set collection is usually very simple, but very light. Or just part of a really heavy, complex game. And then it gets heavy. This is a simple... Um, rules like game that is so crunchy I am so impressed by it it's maybe even for me and Jen a little bit too crunchy a little too heavy for us which is really saying something. And honestly, that's a feather in the cap of Museum Pictura. And that was the run-through, folks. Thanks very much for watching. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.